At AIA Australia, we have the tools and support to help you grow your business. Available 24-7, our Business Growth Hub offers an online suite of resources such as marketing tools and help to build out your health and wellbeing proposition. If you're looking for a trusted business partner, chat to your AIA CDM today. Hi, everybody, uh, and welcome to this week's XY Live. Uh, this week, we're talking all about digital advice, uh, and we've got a very special guest in today. We've got Dante Digori from the Financial Planning Association. Thanks for joining us, Dante. Thanks for having me. Uh, as well as the always lovely Naomi Christopher, uh, Phil Thompson, and Adrian Patty. Welcome, everyone. Hey. Thanks, Benny. And cheers to our mates at AIA for, uh, for their support of XY Live. Look, guys, today we're talking everything digital uh, and digital advice and, and how that plays in with the, the role of the, the traditional advisors. So, Dante, I'm, I'm keen to, uh, to hear from you. You obviously get in front of a lot of advice businesses and, and, uh, and see a lot of what's going on in the industry. So I thought that you could just start us off with, uh, with what you're seeing uh, the tr and some of the trends that you're noticing in this space. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, look, it's obviously a, a hot topic. Uh, every PD day and conference, no doubt you and, and the listeners, I mean, are going to, there's a topic about fintech and, um, and I'd probably start off by saying from, from our perspective uh, here at the FPA, we've really looked at this and said, well, what's actually happening? What can we do about it? Um, how do we support members and financial planners in particular? And part of that process then is to try and understand the landscape a little bit about what this technology is, um, uh, what's in Australia, what's happening in that respect, but also experiences internationally too. Um, in terms of potential trends, uh, we follow a lot in terms of what's happening in the US as an example. So this concept of advisors being replaced by technology is, in my view, uh, not uh, not an issue at this point in time. It's not something where, um, you know, I often get calls from journos saying, oh, you know, advisors are you know going to be replaced. There's no need for them anymore. You know, we have robo-advisors. Um, I don't believe that for a moment. But I do believe, to get to your point, that um, the way financial advisors will work, the financial advice process um, is going to ultimately change, completely change, and is changing already now. Um, so for us, we're looking at it and saying, well, what or how will it change? Now, I don't know. I don't know the answer to it, but you can already see um, advisors implementing technology solutions in their business to make them more efficient. So we're embracing it, which I think is a great thing. Um, I don't find too many advisors uh, concerned by it or, you know, threatened by the technology. The issue is we're overwhelmed by it. Like, I don't know if you guys know, but from uh, we, we have been doing a bit of an analysis in this space. And at any one point, there's about 400 fintech providers uh, in this country um, at all different stages, starting up all the way through to um, being, uh, being available for purchase. And for me, as an advisor, as an individual, um, even as a business owner or business operator here, I should say, with the FPA, it's overwhelming to understand what technology you should go with, what technology you should use, uh, for what part of the business um, do you need that technology for, um, and how is it going to change the way we actually work with our members, and then conversely, how is that going to change the way our members work with consumers? So. It's a it's an interesting and fascinating point. Um, all we know, it's going to change. Um, we just don't know exactly how it's going to change. Yeah, sure. And I think that's you know, there's so much uh, tech out there. You're saying 400 fintech providers. There's uh, arguably hundreds, if not thousands, of other providers that apply that may not be fintech, but uh, oh, absolutely apply to financial advice and and financial services businesses. So yeah, it's, it's most certainly overwhelming. In fact, you can actually get lost in it. Uh, if you just ask Adrian Patty, he basically spends 85% uh, of his time just researching new uh, types of technology and figuring out how to join them <laughs> together. Uh, so uh, yeah, def definitely a big space. No to boat. Exactly, that's well, right. It's only the way to stay on the, the frontier. 
<laughs> well, yes, that's uh, that's one way to put it. So, <laughs> look, we're you know we I think we we saw this explosion of digital advice uh, a little while back, in particular out of the states, fully automated advice, mm. uh, and now it sort of seems like it's it's uh, it's wound back a, a, a little. Um, Naomi, I know that you were over in uh, in the US just recently. What 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 did you see there, and and what can we learn from that? Yeah, so um, what we saw many of the larger companies that were doing uh, fully automated digital advice actually uh, pivot um, and come back to a model that is advisor assisted or a model that. Um, where the client may start the advice process digitally, but there are escalation points in place along the way uh, where they can uh, get in contact with an advisor or the SOA process uh, is only finished once an advisor has signed it off or, um, or they can web chat an advisor, they can talk to them over the phone. Uh, and the digital part of the advice process was more of a client engagement process to get them in in the beginning, um, which uh, I find, uh, quite interesting because they did full circle went uh, we don't need advisors anymore so we're going to do uh, full scale digital advice and then come back to actually this didn't work people didn't want it people still wanted to talk to an advisor so they've come back um and i guess I, i'd like to explore um a bit more what dante thinks of that and does do you think that this is the way that the industry will go in australia as well um We've seen a lot of automated, fully automated robo advisors, but they haven't shown to be really successful yet. But the digital advice that is advisor assisted seems to be doing better. Um, so, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, that's exactly the uh, what I'm hearing and what I've heard. I've spoken to my counterparts in the US uh, as well, and uh, they've said exactly the same thing. Um, and in fact. Um, What's quite interesting is that uh, I was there, over there in Denver uh, a few weeks ago and we got a presentation done by Vanguard um, and basically who, who are massive in this space, but yeah. they also are one of the biggest employers of certified financial planners um, in their business. Now it's all phone based, but um, uh, you know, they, they have realized that they still need and still want to use and their, and their investors that invest with them want to have um, uh, an advisor that I speak with, even though the technology is there for them to do a lot of it themselves. Um, and I think this is a, a bigger, um, a, a bigger uh, issue, I think, or maybe not, issue is not the right word for it, but um, I was watching a program the other day about artificial intelligence, which I think for me scares the bejesus out of me, to be quite honest. <laughs> what, all this technology and it's moving so fast and it, we can do such great things, um, and the technology it will can, in theory, um, uh, replace what a human does. The, the missing link that people forget about, and that's why these companies are going back and saying, well, nothing's happening even though we've got the technology, is that we as humans, as citizens, aren't ready. Um, so even though the technology is there, it doesn't automatically mean that we're going to feel comfortable to do certain things just with technology. Um, I think as a, as, as a consumer, um, obviously I want to use everything that I do, whether it's a service that I purchase, and in this case, if it's advice, I think the use of technology is something I expect in this day and age. But I don't, I'm not comfortable for that to be purely the only experience I have around advice, uh, to be technology only. So, um, so I think uh, it's inevitable that technology is going to play a bigger role, but it's not going to happen as fast as these, I believe, these robo companies uh, believe, because we're just not ready as a society. Um, it's the same thing with driverless cars and all that type of stuff. The technology is there, but we as consumers have to be ready to, to jump down that uh, path. And I think it's going to happen over iterations, right? So what we're going to see now, and to your point, Naomi, which is exactly what's happening, the robo uh, or the automated digital advice uh, technology companies are now targeting financial planning businesses. It's happening in the US and it's happening here as well. Um, because they know that even though they've got the technology, the, 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 their best way to get in front of a, a consumer is through a financial planning business. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that it, it's uh, it's scary f for people, and uh, and I think in particular if you if you build a lot of assets and and wealth to just uh, just to park it up, hand it all over to a to a robot and and you know be fully reliant on the technology. I know that for me that's a little scary. I think that people want 
to know that someone's responsible and that also that there's there's someone to blame or someone to talk to if something goes wrong as well. Uh, so I'm keen to hear from from the from the other advisors here on uh, you know we're seeing this big trend towards digital um, you know more and more sort of solutions in this space but I'm wondering what role uh, the traditional advisor has to play in the future and you know is it that we're all just moving further up the value chain is that the only only space that uh, that advisors are um, going to be playing in the in the future there's a lot of talk now about this coaching relationship with with clients is that what the future is like for us Tomo, I'll start with you. Yeah, I 100%. I think that's where we're going to go. Like the the information that we can provide clients uh, is going to be dead. Well, they can get that information anywhere, I believe. Um, you know, tailored information. Yeah, there, there's a little bit of a place there, but once once we get this kind of AI or once you know consumers are ready to give away all their data to get really rich information back to them um, which we already do anyway using facebook and google um that providing information is going to be useless really um but it's just really about what you know making sure we maximize the value that we provide our consumers like i was talking to my sister has started a decluttering business she goes in and helps people declutter their houses and I was talking to a friend and they're like, how, how is that a business? Like, we all know how to tidy up a room, um, but there is someone who gets paid to help clean up people's houses for them. Um, it's not a matter of lack of information that they, that they can't do it themselves. It's a matter of lack of time, uh, you know, lack of energy of wanting to focus on it. And so there will always be a place for us um, as traditional advisors. Um, but it's just more about that coaching, as you said, um, that, that really is what we'll play in. If we want to hang our hat on and say we're the best investors in the world, um, we're never going to do it. We're never going to be the cheapest. We're never going to outperform the market consistently year after year after year. Um, so we need to kind of change the way we think about what advice is. And it isn't just an insurance recommendation or an investment recommendation, but it's about helping clients kind of, you know, achieve the things that they want to achieve in life. Do it. Patty? Yeah, I think the stage we're at at the moment is fixing existing problems um, for, for advisors in terms of the technology piece. So a lot of the tech that's coming out is looking at how, what are our problems at the moment? How do we deliver insurance advice better? How do we deliver um, investment advice better and easier? Um, where are the pain points in an advice practice? There's a lot of technology coming out around that, but I guess where the, I really like the value chain piece, Ben, that um, I, I agree with that. I think um, everyone, everyone is constantly being pushed up the value chain because technology eats up low value, um, you know, low value services and it will continue to do so. So I, I just think um, a bit with what Dante was saying and, and Naomi in terms of the behavioural piece, I think gradually over, over time, people are going to get used to different ways of behaving with finances and there's going to just be new ways of interacting and, and some of the technology that's trying new things will be, will be, um, will be pretty cool. And, uh, but, but we're not right there, there yet. So it's just, it's a time thing. Yeah. I, I, I think it, it's, uh, it's increasing more and more, I suppose, the, the breadth of, of, of where the technology fits and, and what it can do. Uh, I, I wonder, uh, from you, Dante, I, I know that uh, the the FPA and uh, you know our industry associations are going through these professional standards sort of uh, process at the moment, um, and FPA obviously uh, are big on on their internal professional standards and have been for a long time. Um, I wonder. Well, I'm interested in your thoughts on in relation to. The, you know this uptake of digital type solutions and digital engagement where consumers don't always know what they need or want and uh interested in in uh you know how you how you think that, that will impact with people self-selecting but potentially self-selecting the wrong areas yeah it's it's a very good question um and it's one that um it's actually one that we're discussing even at an international level uh, around um, around the role of, uh, of regulation of, of digital advice. Um, and, uh, and, and 
I suppose one of the things that I think um, uh, we need to think about here is, and this is the battle, I suppose, from a regulatory perspective, is um, we have, if you like, from a regulatory space, a definition of advice in Australia. Um, so personal advice provided to an individual um, is defined and there are obligations if you're going to do that, right? So to your point, if a consumer goes online um, and they use a tool or, 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 or make an investment, the question that has to be asked is that, was that personal advice given or was it, not, or was it something else? Um, and then... And then, so that's the regulatory question. And then there's the question on the consumer side. Is that what I was after? Um, what did I actually receive um, uh, in, in respect to that interaction that I had? So that's very difficult. And I have, and we do have concerns that, that digital, um, digital is going to be used a way to distribute many more products and investments to more consumers. And I think, um, uh, I think that for us is a, is, is a concern. Uh, and we have to, and the problem is that we, we're competing on two fronts. You've got, on one front, you've got to have the same consumer protections um, for consumers when they're dealing on uh, services. Whether on you as a, uh, from an automated tool, um, they, they're, they need to be afforded the same protections. But on the other side, we've also got the competing need where we want fintech to flourish. Innovation in our space has been forever um, needed and cried out for. Um, and those people who want that innovation don't want to go through the same hurdles, same obligations and the same um, requirements as a, a human does. And I think for us, that this is going to come to a head in that respect. Um, so there is possibly, uh, and there is, uh, without a doubt, um, potential for consumers to get what they're not after or to get, as you say, to not know what they actually need and, you know, and they're basically getting rubbish at the end of it as a result. How do you bring the two worlds together? Uh, and that for, my, for us is a very interesting question and proposition. Um, we, you know, we have some thoughts around that. I'm happy to sort of talk about that because I think the model of the advice uh, standards and the advice process today has to change for tomorrow if you want to blend technology and humans together. And, and, and just to give you a catch a catchphrase or a, or a line that I think should lead this discussion um, in respect to this space is human-led, digitally powered. I mean, what's the way I think the iteration before we go to full artificial intel intelligence and humans are no longer needed for anything, um, the next iteration and uh, around this is human led. So a human has to lead this, um, uh, but it's powered by digital in terms of how we deliver advice. And I think if we, from our perspective, if you look at it from that, then you can way the consumer um, receives the advice or receives these services and how it should be regulated. Uh, you're on mute, Benny. You're on mute. Just taking my phone. Yeah, technology, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that means it so you got it basically fitting into the older model where you've got the advisor is still on the hook for the for the digitally provided advice but i wonder that you know now with this you know our standards are higher high and increasing as they should um but then you know what are the considerations moving forward where uh you you've got the the robot responsible for providing the advice do you think that we'll ever get there or do we need the person to be on the line? Well, I, I don't know about you but I, at this point it, it might be the situation where that may occur but I, I personally can't see it in the media in the, in the short to medium term a, a human being still has to be responsible in my view and I, I love your thoughts on this because someone built the robot someone built the technology someone built the algorithm it was it wasn't another robot it was, it was a human being that sits behind it. And in fact, one of the things that we pushed for very hard with ASIC last year was that algorithms, I get told algorithms are unbiased and conflict-free, and in fact, an algorithm for the purpose of this discussion of independent, and an algorithm can be an independent because they're pure uh, and, and conflict-free. Why the BS? Because a human being has to develop the algorithm. Um, and, uh, and, and a human still the a, a, a human being is still being used. So we said 
that person must have some financial advice experience or expertise uh, or, or that algorithm must be built with someone with that and therefore that person takes ownership of the algorithm and in fact we called for the algorithm to be independently independently ref, uh, verified or, or checked rather than the technology company who built it who might be you know owned or supported by or funded by a product provider um, building and taking a, and having that algorithm because for me that's a flaw that's a conflict possible conflict possible biases built into the algorithm so to answer your question, the human there has to be a human ultimately responsible for the advice or for the service that was given to the consumer at the on the uh, at the at the end of that uh, transaction. Is that a is that a CFP developer certification? Uh, well, well, I mean, look, uh, you know, CFP or something um, with you know, and, and this is in, in all seriousness. Um, uh, why not a credit? Why not uh, legitimise um, robo technology, robo advisors? And say, well, if you, you know, you still need to understand advice. You still need to understand, um, uh, in our view, uh, the same rules. Even though a computer or technology might, you know, that might know those uh, that information because it's built in. You know, the, the superannuation rules, um, the tax laws, etc. But it's still someone still needed to program it from that perspective. It still needed. It still needs to know how to apply it in an advice scenario. So why not accredit them? Uh, or li license them the same way as you would you and any other person. Agreed. Yeah. I, I, I personally think we need to go one step further back and distinguish between personal advice and general advice. That's the biggest, oh, muddiest, unclear thing ever in our industry. Like, I called up a super fund the other day and I got told that if I, as a member, want to get advice, I could get specialist general advice or tailored personal advice. Like, how is a consumer, like, I'm, I'm a financial advisor, I don't even understand the difference. So how is a consumer going to understand that? And that's that's where these robo players play under the general advice, you know, Agreed. rule. And we play under the personal advice. And that the whole distinction between them is so muddy, so unclear. And, you know, in our Facebook group, one of the big bugbears that some people have uh, is with Barefoot Investor. He's giving general advice. I, I personally think Barefoot Investor is doing incredible things, but the, you can understand the, the issue with advisors have with it because we play under personal advice, he plays under general advice, and we do the same thing, essentially. Yeah, well, he's not held up to the same standards and obligation and costs that you are, uh, and, and his readers or subscribers, or whoever they are, um, are but they, I bet you if you ask them, some believe that Barefoot Investor is giving them, giving them advice. So I totally agree with you, but in fact, you know, again, again, I don't want to get into the regular the policy policy. But we have been advocating for the last five years for general advice to go. Um, it's not it's not a feature that's done anywhere else in the world. You either have advice or you have information about products, and that's it. You have factual information and advice, and I think that's the way it should be in Australia. Yeah, I think it's, it can certainly uh, be clarified. Patty, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this, uh, you know, self-directed uh, digital advice and uh, views as to what, whether that's an, an issue for consumers. Oh, it's definitely an issue for consumers, depending on how it's done. Like there's lots of tools. Tools have always been available on bank sites, on financial planning websites, and people can do what they will with it. Um, I reckon the and like I think, I think they can be really good tools. And a lot of the robo advice, some of the, some of the stuff is awesome, really good, and, and then like it's going to generate an outcome, nine, a great outcome, ninety percent of the time. I guess the it's it's the question is, are we concerned about the effectiveness of them and the appropriateness, or are we concerned about why why we have to go through a whole lot of shit and and no one and someone can just go and do general advice, arguably, and don't have to. Um, uh, and don't have to be held up to the same sort of uh, scrutiny. And what what does that, um, I guess, what, what do we get for being advisors that's different than someone that can just go around saying whatever they want in a book? Um, and what, yeah, I think that's sort of... <laughs> if, I can, if I can jump in, sorry, Ben. I was just yeah, going to say, doesn't it come down to truth in labelling? I mean, that's all, that's all I think. 
consumer perspective, it's about exactly knowing what they're getting. I don't dispute and disagree with you. The technology and the calculators and the, um, and the tools are brilliant. And for people that want to do it themselves and want have their own control who probably wouldn't use or want to see a financial planner anyway, great, brilliant. But don't sell it as advice. It's just self-directed tool, uh, tools that help them self-direct what they want to do um, with whatever it is that they're, they're looking for. And so therefore the, the public needs to be clearly told and, and, and informed that there's a difference between using these tools which can assist you, you know, lead you in a certain direction, but that's not, that's not advice. Uh, it's just not advice. If you want advice, then this, it's, this is what happens and this is the other process. So there is a difference. The issue we've got today, Adrian, is that, and, and you know, institutions are doing this and there's court cases at the moment with ASIC, but you, you, you have people who are using the ambiguity and the, and, and the, um, and the, uh, and the um, uncertainty of these definitions to masquerade uh, a service as potentially being advice. You know, they're happy for the consumer to think it's advice, even though technically it's not, because it's in their favour to do so. Mm. Well, so I might add to what... Sorry, Ben, I might add to just what I was... I was sort of answering and questioning at the same time. Um, my experience has been that it actually, a lot of the stuff out there has actually moved us up the, it actually makes it easier as an advisor. I've got a client that will come in, they might talk about the barefoot investor, they might talk about these tools that they've used and the information's there, the tools are out there. Um, I, my experience has been it's actually getting people to the pointier end of where we add value quicker and saving us, <laughs> like saving us time. Um, I think that's sort of, that's the play. That's how things are playing out, which is which is pretty cool actually, because I like that effect. If you don't have to muck around in the lower value piece, and um, mm. people are coming in more educated, um, then it's helping you get to the value piece where you can really um, transform and and deliver more for the uh, the advice client. So just to follow up on on those previous clients, Dante, like I, I personally, I think that. It, a big issue for consumers that that causes quite a lot of problems and could potentially solve some of these issues is the fact that uh, consumers still don't understand what financial advice is, how it works, what's possible, or what they should be doing. So, from you guys uh, as an association perspective, like, what are your thoughts on that, and what should we be doing to make that clearer for consumers? Because with this rise of digital and self led sort of solutions if there was a resource for people where they could actually learn and get the, the facts yeah. straight before they then launched into the uh into the self-directed space is that a, is that a necessary step or you know what are we doing there it's a brilliant question and it's it's an age-old question uh, in fact it's probably the biggest uh, arguably probably the biggest challenge i think as a profession we have is actually articulating the what financial planning is, um, what financial advice is, and the awareness. So, you know, I uh, um, this week is financial planning week, um, and and you know, it's something that we uh, and the objective of, of of something like that is just to do exactly that. Ben is to try and educate the public that financial planning actually exists. So, you know, this the the, the, the reality is that people still don't really understand financial advice and financial planning that it's there and it's it's something that they can actually um, uh, can access. But also, what is it? What is it that they can get out of financial planning? How can how can a, how can seeing a financial planner help them? Uh, and it's 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 very much about getting that awareness um, and understanding. And to your point, I suppose what we need to do now, because. If I was to go back in time, if I could, if, if I could have the last ten or fifteen years again, so definitely pre GFC, I would have fought so hard for advisors to not leverage their value, if you like, or their or their or their um or their reason for being as 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 investments or, or the return on investments, because many advisors lived off the fact that markets were just going up and up, and that was their value proposition. But in fact, that was obviously all BS and nothing they could ever control. And therefore, as a result of that, consumers and the public connect investment with advice only. They don't connect, you know, budgeting. Um, they don't connect cash flow, debt management. They don't connect short-term savings goals that are actually of interest to them now as opposed to retirement as something a financial planner can help them with. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to retell the narrative around what financial planning is and how it can help them. And then to your point, what we need to add into there next is the use of tools and resources, the digital 
uh, resources are available to help educate uh, consumers about that. And perhaps, as Adrian said, that that's a step in the process of them going to get advice and the use of digital resources and tools is a way to engage them with the advice process um, in a way that's less threatening before they're ready to actually go through the full process. So uh, there's a multiple fronts there, but that whole awareness and education piece is absolutely crucial. But uh, what, absolutely so, the narrative will change. What, why, why can't we just have a really good website? Like I think ASIC did amazingly with the Money Smart website. There's some great tools and, and resources on there. Like people look at websites. I've heard of that. I'm pretty sure that's the thing, right? So why can't we just have like a, like a really good website that makes this stuff clear to consumers? Like, should we be hounding ASIC about this or? Well, um, I think we should leverage off what ASIC's done. I mean, uh, uh, um, you know, the FPA is, tried to, is trying to do that. I know the AFA has as well. I mean, we've got Money and Life as a website and that's designed purely to try uh, and engage directly with consumers. It was also our, uh, our way of, of bypassing traditional media because, you know, as much as you want to talk about financial planning in a positive light, your traditional journalist is not really going to be interested unless it's going to mm. be something that's going to create interest in a, in a clickbait mm. or story mm. perspective. So we've gone and developed a website, which is financial planners talking to consumers directly. Uh, and it's a way of exposing financial planners to consumers without them needing to actually go that step of seeing a financial planner first. And it's all about using financial planners and expertise to talk about things that matter to consumers today. Like, I think one of our, the one, the number one articles that consumers are actually clicking through on the Money and Life website is about um, uh, uh, planning for my daughter's wedding. So again, people don't normally traditionally connect a, 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 a goal of, of saving for my daughter's wedding or um, you know, putting my kids through school or maybe even getting a deposit for a home as something a financial planner can actually help them. Now, it might, now there's tools out there that can tell you how to do it, but you know what's missing is people aren't disciplined. People aren't, aren't mm. able to actually implement it without some assistance. Uh, and that's where I think the narrative will change in our space. And you guys talked about it before that financial coaching, that financial um, um, uh, support person is what an advisor role I think will, will move into because, you know, if you look at the other industries like um, uh, personal fitness, um, technology is rife in there as well, right? I mean, you can have apps and, and wristbands and stuff that tell you everything about you and your heart rate and how many calories you've burned and all this type of stuff. But personal trainers still exist because people aren't disciplined. Human beings yeah. aren't disciplined. So, yeah. um, so, so I think the narrative about what financial planning can help, can do for a consumer uh, needs to be told, first point. But I think that narrative is going to slowly change over time as technology, you know, obviously uh, embeds our, our industry more and more. Yeah. Naomi, you've been a bit quiet down there. Yeah, no, I've got, I've got a question. I mean, under the, say under the guise or under the um, impression that, uh, as Adrian said, um, digital advice and all of, all of fintech in general is, um, is a positive thing for advisors. Um, and especially saying um, that a lot of the robo advisors have, have pivoted and come back to, um, to now see financial advisors as their target market. Um, so, uh, would you say then that um, if digital advice is helping advisors, that um, digital advice in a way is helping us increase that number of people receiving advice from the 20% to higher? Um, or is that question a bit of a great question? Like I feel, uh, personally, I feel like coming from a tech company as well, that it is um, because you're serving a, a new generation of advice seekers who want to be engaged digitally first in a way that's not threatening. Um, that's my personal opinion, but I'd be interested to hear what you think, Dante, about that. I think the data, the data so far doesn't tell us that it has moved the dial, um, but I think the, uh, I, you know, if I look at it, the, the, and I think everyone would agree, the potential for digital to help move that dial is, is, is massive, right? Um, the use of technology for even for an advice firm to reach out to potential clients or clients that otherwise would not be traditional clients is, is an opportunity that didn't exist without digital. So, so yes, I agree with you hundred percent, but the, the research or the data today doesn't tell us that it's translated to that as yet. Um, I think there's still a bit more to go and maybe in five years time that has significantly changed. 
But I think the challenge is we haven't yet, um, uh, very much similar to the, to the technology companies themselves, uh, advisors yet haven't yet worked out how to use the technology to reach more clients or to, mm. to reach a wider group of consumers or potential clients um, in a way that it feeds into them to be clients in the future. So I'm sure some have, but I think as a collective industry, we haven't yet nutted that out. And I think part of it is because we're still working out which technology to use and how to actually use it in, our, in the financial planning process and in our businesses. So Naomi, I, I know that Midwinter obviously play a lot in uh, the, the digital space with, you know, trying to automate as much things as possible. Mm. Interested in what you guys are seeing uh, as the, like, is there a, uh, a tipping point or a point where you, you're seeing it, the technology used most effectively by advice businesses? Yeah, um, look, I mean, uh, similar to what Dante said, it, it's a bit early to say how the research hasn't shown success, uh, where, the, where the ultimate success lies yet. We're going through the first sort of year or two of, of our clients actually using a digital advice process. Um, what we have found is that um, financial advice under super, under super has been a place where that has been implemented successfully and is working um, in a way that helps um, uh, members and clients engage with their super, uh, which, which has been a bit of a hot topic lately. So uh, trying to get especially younger people um, engaged in super has always been hard because they always see it as, as something that they can't touch forever. They don't see it as their own money. Um, so bringing in a digital advice process when it comes to talking about super and insurance and things like that have we've seen from a technology point of view um, with our clients. So, oh, I mean, not, just in, in the industry in general, actually, I'm not going to say just us, everyone, um, that that has been a, a, a place that's been, uh, it's, it's been successfully implemented and it's working. So um, people, people are, um, and members are more engaged um, in, in their super in general, whether that means that it, it escalates. I mean, our product obviously has been designed to escalate to, to either phone-based advice, web chat advice, or face-to-face -face advice. Um, uh, but everyone's got their different products. That's Midwinter's um, designed for advisors. Uh, we're still yet to see um, uh, advisors grab onto that and use it as much as, um, as advisors under superannuation. Yeah, so anyone watching uh, live, you can also just um, putting questions into the chat box uh, for Dante. Um, but um, I guess my question for you, Dante, is um, just off the back of that uh, scaled advice conversation and using robo advice, do you think that um, as advisors, I guess my concern is if I build out a model where I can do scaled advice and I'm charging clients a small fee, but I'm charging a lot of clients, um, will I then get into the realm where the CBAs of the world are where clients feel like they haven't received advice and I'm charging a fee for advice that haven't been provided? Like that's my first thought in that space is going, how do I build a scaled advice offering where the clients feel like they're receiving advice and not just the robots? giving them, you know, a product that I'm purchasing is giving them that advice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. And and without a doubt, um, you know, that this this debate about scaled advice has been around, as you know, um, you know, pre-digital, I suppose, and that the answer even uh, before um, around how do we make advi the advice process more efficient and how do we encourage or engage more consumers was always, the solution was always, let's look at limited or scaled advice as a concept. It absolutely can be done, and, and, and the FPA feels and the regulator feels, I mean, that, that, that you can actually do uh, scaled advice, which is personal advice, so it is, is advice. The, 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 issue, uh, the issue we have, and, and, and I suppose where we fall down as an industry, uh, where we don't do it right, is that it's, it's, again, we use scaled advice as the umbrella, as the, as the concept, but we've just flogged a product, right? And so this is where we have to be very careful. We don't, a, 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 an automation or a tool or a robot, you know, they might want to go down that road of just at the, end, at the end of this process, you're going to get this product. If we're going to do scaled advice well, in my view, and enable to service um, bite site chunks of advice to consumers so they can afford it and they can get it when they want it, 
um, it's still got to be advice. So it's still got to be about them uh, and it's about them. And the advice might not be a product. So you might be just helping them set up a budget or a, um, or manage their cash flow. Um, you know, that's advice. You, you, you've supported them. You should be able to charge for it, right? So, um, but of course, where there's product at the end or a product recommendation at the end, then you just have to ensure that, you know, what the client is asking for, what you're going to deliver, it's articulated and communicated very succinctly because where, where it gets uh, the trouble at the back end, where, the, where we get complaints about is this, the, this, the advice has been scaled artificially, if you like. It's not what the client wanted. It's not what, you know, uh, what was agreed to. It's what the advisor wanted. The advisor only wanted to do this. Um, and, and I have to say it does happen very much in the life risk space. Um, if, if it's nothing wrong with just providing advice on life risk, but it's got to be communicated. It's got to be, there's got to be no question mark or ambiguity between the client and you that that's what you're going to provide advice on. And it's the communication that we fall down on. So I don't know if I answered your question. You can absolutely do it, but we're not doing it well. But yeah, again, I kind of come back to this just ambiguity around general scale because, you know, you think about the barefoot investor, he's giving yeah. general advice. Oh, he's he's giving general advice. It's not scaled advice it, it's, because it's, it's not scaled advice under a personal advice context. And, and, and that's why it's confusing. You know, super funds use this, you know, tailored personal advice. It's just, you know, I'm an industry fund. I want you to um, retain your, you know, you yeah. as a member. Um, and so they, they use a scaled advice model. So we've got this spectrum of advice. We all call advice. It's general, scaled, you know, tailored personal, personal, you know, full service, whatever, you know, there's a whole spectrum of advice that makes it really confusing. I agree. And that's why I think going back to the discussion we had earlier, general advice has got to go because I think that, that would help remove some of the ambiguity because you've got, so you've got basically a factual information, product information, and then advice. Within advice, advice doesn't necessarily mean it has to be comprehensive, holistic, but it's advice because it's personal. And that way then you don't get in the issue of whether it's general advice or scaled advice from a personal sense or whether it's personal holistic. You then just have advice. And, and it's, not, it's no longer a question about, you know, um, whether it's scaled, uh, sorry, general advice or scaled advice because general advice in theory, if, if we get out of the new world, it doesn't exist. If we and just my, last, just my last question. That's, that's a big thing that you guys at the FBA are fighting for is to change mm -hmm. the general advice to uh, general information or sales. Or sales that's right. Theory. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, it just, it's, it's, I mean, for me, it's product uh, sale, product sales or product information. Um, that's where it's mainly used. Um, if anyone has been on the end of a general advice call or seminar, it's about selling a product at the end. Yeah, now, what you're doing there, Dante. Um, I, I'd like to raise the, so say general personal, within personal, we've mentioned scaled and uh, comprehensive. Mm. Best interest duty covers both of those. Yes. Now, what are, your, what are your thoughts around the issues of scaled advice, excluding the fiduciary responsibility of advisors to identify risks for clients um, and actually direct them in the right direction? And the issues around that, because... Scale advice is done differently um, and often there's things identified where people should probably go see another professional or another specialist in that space. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, look, look again, it's a, it's a, um, the best interest duty requires that obviously you provide advice in the client's best interest and there's obviously the safe harbor provision. So that's the technical side of it. But ultimately where scaled advice has got to work is that it's got to be quite clear the scope of the advice is going to be delivered, right? So just because um, you're, you're scoping the advice uh, to be provided about X, one thing, um, as, a, as, a, as the professional in the room, you might, as you say, identify the client needs advice on a few other areas or there are other issues that need to be addressed. You need to demonstrate that you've identified them and that you've communicated to the client. It doesn't mean you have to provide advice on them. And that's the key thing. Um, and where, where, we're, where, we're, where we're not doing it right is that we're just pretending those things don't exist and we don't tell the client about it. And then if something happens down the track, the advisor's at fault because the advisor's just skipped over it. So even though the client might want to come in and say, look, I just want to, I just want to consolidate my super. And once you start that conversation, once you start your fact find, you know that you'll start identifying different things through that conversation that you think, oh, wait a minute, these might be issues. So as a professional, the upfront piece of work might still not be different because you're identifying all these things 
but you're delivering advice purely or you're delivering, de uh, delivering advice that you've scoped in terms of what you're going to deliver. And it's just that, that process of articulating what you're going to do and what you're not going to do that's really important. And again, we're not doing that very well. Um, as an individual professional and with your experience, you will identify things. You just need to notify the client. And if the client doesn't want to do it, that's their choice. You can't make them do it. But to protect yourself and to do it under the new rule, under the best interest duty rules, you just have to make sure you cover yourself on those basis. And, and this is where I think we, this is where as an industry we get this wrong because people see scaled advice as being scaled in, I only want to ask one question and I want to deliver this one thing. The, the reality is you still have to diagnose the client. You still have to, you still have to find out what the problem is uh, through the fact-finding process. It's just that your solution might be scaled or you might scope the advice to be about one or two things, um, but it doesn't mean you haven't identified those other things and encourage the client to either do something about it now or later. So how does that work? How do you, or how do you see that working in, in practice, Dante? Because I agree that uh, scaled advice does have a place. Like there are certain circumstances where the, uh, someone just wants help in, in one area. Um, so yeah. by scaling advice, that can be good. But there's also areas where it's used where it's, as you say, you just put the blinkers on, focus on your one area, and really yeah. there could be issues that should that it's in the client's interest to address in other areas. So I, I love the idea of, of, you know, having people to identify them, but practically how do you see that working? And I think this is where technology can play a big part. I mean, um, you know, the diagnostics aspect of all their financials is one thing. I mean, really... Technology for me to enable a financial advisor to have information at their disposal um, uh, much quicker and easier. Um, so that's the financial side. And then you can have, and then through your discussion, you will identify things. I, I mean, you know, I, this question about, I've had this debate with many people about full fact finds versus, you know, tailored fact finds, et cetera, et cetera. As an individual a practitioner, you sit in front of a client, yeah, you've got questions you want, to, you want to ask, but through that conversation, that will flow into other areas naturally. And through your experience, you will go into different areas naturally. Now, as the professional, you know, you're the one leading that discussion, you're the one leading that debate and uh, that, that question, line of questioning. What you identify, you can't then pretend you didn't hear or didn't, uh, didn't identify. So you have to then use that process to either scale out or inform the client that you, they should get advice on it. Practically, yes, I don't believe it reduces that upfront diagnostic piece, I agree. And I, I know that's the reason why people get frustrated with scaled advice because they want it to be a reduced fact find and they want it to be a reduced SOA and a reduced uh, research bit in the middle of the strategy. Um, so to answer your question, I think the upfront piece, piece is still very important whether you're gonna deliver holistic or scale but we have to use technology to help make it more practical um, because we're not doing it. And maybe for me, it's technology to help. How do we use technology to make that process more efficient? Because as the, as the professional, um, I mean, I hate to go to a doctor and a doctor to, you know, uh, to ask me questions and to know that there's probably something or an issue that I should be dealing with, but then decides not to address it, which, which they might or may not do. But I'd hate, to, I'd hate to know that you as, as the advisor knew about something and failed to inform you that I should do something about it because we just wanted to deliver advice on X. Um, now, if you generally don't know about something, that's a different story. But through your experiences, I'm sure you will identify things through your uh, interview process that the client wasn't expecting to tell you about. Um, and as a result of that, you can't unknow what you know. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. I suppose though it's the depth though of the fact find. Like yeah. I, I would spend in the order of like five hours with one of my clients before I, I give them any recommendations. Now, if I see someone and they say I want uh, I want help setting up an income protection policy, we we don't really do that. But if I wanted to do it, like mm. what what am I going to do? I'm going to charge them for five hours to find out stuff and uh, that, that, that they're saying that they don't want, uh, they don't want the diagnosis as well. So I think you've got to, you got your work cut out for you there, mate. Yeah, look, I agree. It's, 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 it's a, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult question to answer, but it's a, you know, again, do you then have various fact finds tailored, um, uh, you know, and then use all different fact finds for different, different outcomes um and i just don't think that's practical either so 
you, know, mm. you, you as an individual practitioner is going to, you know, you're not going to uh, be comfortable in avoiding questions purely because you don't want to know the answers to those questions because you don't have, have to deal with it. So, look, I'm not saying there's an answer to it exactly. and But what I'm saying, though, is that industry is doing it anyway. Um, industry is not doing your five-hour fact-find process. Most advisors or many advisors aren't doing that um, because if it's they want to scale through to a particular solution, that's what they're doing. So we're not doing it right now is the problem. Um, and, um, uh, and, and as a result of that, um, we, I think we are failing the best interest duty with or without technology. So where do we go from here then? <laughs> 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 oh, Naomi, you have all the solutions for us, don't you? The, the <laughs> it might be, might be a good, um, a good question for Dante. I feel like my, my solution or my, uh, opinion might be biased here. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, look. It's a clearly a very curly uh, issue, uh, and uh, and I'm sure we could we could talk about the merits of, of different approaches all day, um, but I'm not sure we'd, we'd get any closer to the perfect solution. Um, but look, uh, yeah, that's great discussion. Um, I think yes, it's some uh, some interesting stuff there. Clearly, the digital wave is coming. Uh, so it's just about who can uh, who can leverage it the most to, to get the best results. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Dante. Really appreciate your time. It's been great to have you on and, and get some of your insights. Pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. It was really enjoyable. Cool. And XY team, thank you. Thanks, uh, Benny. Thanks, thank guys. You. Good to be with you guys. And uh, we'll see you same time next week. Awesome. Thanks, mate. See you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.